If anything, I would say that the digital and digital media kind of produce analog literature anew and are a, a big source of inspiration rather than a really serious threat. What is a novel? It's a very hard question to answer because uh, technically we are talking about a text of a certain length that has been uh, published at once in one form. Uh, Mikhail Bakhtin is a Russian literary critic who has said at one point that the novel is like the most fluid of art forms. And what he meant by that was that, of course, a novel uses language, it's literary prose, which is a very worn down, much used um, met matter material for communication. So we use it every day and it gets kind of tainted with this everydayness and language, of course, also changes. And then another thing he meant by that was that the novel is open ended. So uh, this means that the novel will always try to change along with our changing life world. It will never be the same thing in any decade or from any place. And I think that what we see today is that, well, the novel is kind of uh, pressed to keep up with the fast pace that our society is changing. So it will try to adapt, and it often gets the criticism that it doesn't adapt soon enough, that it lags behind, that you will see a form of delay or retardation. On the one hand, I would say that today we see a lot of novels adapting themselves to, for instance, um, quantitative strategies of representation to big data strategies or uh, all forms of lists or enumerations, uh, database aesthetic as it has been called. So that's a way that we see the novels adapt to uh, our current life world. On the other hand, this form of retardation, this delay that is built in, also interests me because it does uh, incite the reader in some way to um, step back and to reflect and to slow down as well. And in this way, we can reflect on all these media, media changes. And it also poses like a nice counter effect in a culture that is very much um, influenced by uh, notions like immediacy or instant gratification or on-demand media. I think I could illustrate this by pointing at a much uh, cited example, I think, would be Karl over Knausgaard, who is like a famous Norwegian writer. Uh, a couple of years ago, he has uh, published a six volume autobiography or, or literary autobiography uh, titled My Struggle. And uh, he has often been called the Norwegian Proust. And I see the resemblance. I know why there is overlap and why would people call him that. But I think the comparison is maybe more interesting because of the differences between the two. Compared to A la Richesse du Temps perdu, I think that my struggle definitely tries to do a similar thing. Uh, the writer is trying to uh, go back to certain moments in his childhood or certain memories that he lost, often in a very intuitive and associative way by um, uh, basing it on sense memories, on smells, for instance. And he then builds onto that and tries to recapture the lost moments. And he has often said that also within the books that he is doing this in a kind of anachronistic statement, uh, going against this trend of being always mediated, always transported elsewhere by the news or whatever. So he's saying that he uses writing to get back into the moment. But paradoxically, the moment is then often past and future and jumping around. In any case, that's I, the way I see the resemblance. But then if you look at what Proust is doing in his works, is often uh, still marked by a form of compression. So he would often summarize different memories or different instances by just telling them once and saying it often went like this or every night I would go to bed early. And what we see Knausgaard doing is quite the opposite in never compressing. He would never select and he is always listing all these different uh, childhood uh, friends that live in a street, for instance, or he will narrate all the different girls he ever fell in love with in his life. So he would say, like, the way he uh, tries to meet her, tries to talk behind her back, how to approach her, and then they will uh, finally fall in love, but then he's too shy to really interact with the girl, and then they break up, and then he cries and cries for pages on end. And then the whole thing starts over again. And this really interests me, like, why would people ever read this and find it fascinating, and why does it have this addictive quality? And I would say that he is, like, Proust, 
used for the Facebook age in a certain sense that we are now also used to not having to compress and not having to select any of our emails or pictures or whatever. So uh, he would be the kind of writer who is then doing the literary equivalent of Instagramming every picture of his meal or uh, like having too many friends on Facebook. It's too much information in a way. So this, I think, would be a clear example of the difference. They're both big, they're both monumental, but what Knausgaard is doing is a bit different from the 19th century monumentality. The word monumental is uh, very interesting for me for several reasons. On the one hand, um, monumental as an adjective seems rarely to be defined. And I find it especially interesting in the context of what has been called the death of the novel. So there have been many people in the last decades, but really ever since the beginning of the novel, been claiming that the death of the novel is inside, is um, um, impending because of certain other media that are more important, for instance, uh, that screen media are more sexy than the novel, maybe. People do not have the time to read. Uh, we live in an attention economy. There are uh, more vital or more um, interesting forms of information available. And also because our attention spans will become shorter because we only read tweets and fragments. So there are all these apocalyptic stories going around. And then I find the adjective monumental very interesting in the light of the death of the novel because it has something, of course, that we associate with like grandiose big effects. It has uh, a relation to the 19th century. You have like a bad branch of monumentality that people find suspect, that is bombastic. You have the association maybe with music and with operas. But no one has really defined this monumental capacity of literature, to my knowledge. So I had to kind of develop a theory for monumentality myself. And I was looking at the 19th century as kind of a precedent for that, and also looking at um, today's uh, context, especially digitalization. So what I feel that monumental means is it has this uh, element of preservation in itself, of trying to preserve something that is important enough to um, uh, transmit to posterity. Then there is bigness, of course. So with monumental novels today, it would be underlined that they have a very heavy, very weighty quality. It also goes beyond the material aspect, because if you call a novel monumental, you will probably mean that the bigness of it, the volume, points to what is inside of them. The fact that they might be um, very um, broad in scope, that there will be a lot of important themes addressed. It is kind of a tour de force for the writer to uh, write something like that. So for me, uh, monumental, if applied to contemporary novels, came to be like um, like a game that you play, something that you use to, uh, to reflect on the future of literature as a whole, as well as this novel. And then particularly in a media ecology where digital media are um, feared to take over the novel. So I was just wondering, is it like a swan song? Is it like a counter movement or is something more going on there? And I think it's definitely more than that in the sense that it's a two way relationship to digitalization to big data in that uh, the novel is on the one hand very much inspired by these developments and changes along with uh, our culture and on the other hand tries to um, resist and tries to underline what is special about literature within such a media ecology. When I'm writing about big data I'm not necessarily talking about the technological aspect of it more than maybe a big data mindset that is associated with it, so the philosophy uh, pertaining to it. It is, of course, the um, ability to process and to transmit and to store unprecedented amounts of data compared to before. But associated with that is also a more ideological aspect of wanting to have this whole data set, so the N is all perspective, the set is the entire set, which does away with um, having to sample, having to select, having to compress, which is maybe what certain people would think that literature was about anyway. We have metaphors, we have way to compress language, so it should all mean something and uh, be very selective, be very evaluative. Um, I think the relationship between this kind of big data and literature is a complex one. There's also the idea that with big data you get this objective sense of knowing everything about a certain subject. And I think that 
big books kind of borrow something from representational strategies from associated with big data um, in a way that's also critical and reflective of these processes and of um, the uh, impossibility of really getting to know everything about a certain subject. So one of the examples that I really like is uh, one chapter or one book in Roberto Bolaño's 2666. And Roberto Bolaño is a writer from Chile who has written a fictionalized version of the mass murders of women in Ciudad Juarez. And in one of the books of 2666, you get this kind of database of these murders. And what he does is not pick one or two victims or a series of victims and then describe that in full detail. So you get to identify maybe with some of the characters or with one of the um, um, policemen. He is um, listing all of these murders and it's like 110 of them. So they will be narrated in the form of police files. So every little lemma, every little um, a text fragment will list all the particulars about a certain victim and what they were wearing and what horrible things have been done to the body in a very clinical, uh, very distanced way, instead of, again, compressing or uh, selecting. And the effect of that, I think, is uh, some form of desensitization. At first, it's really horrific and you don't want to read uh, on. And then at a certain point, you kind of get desensitized because it's too much of, of horror and you get this dissolution of singularity. And I think this is a very powerful book that comments on uh, what happens when you um, have a phenomenon that is really too big to draw um, a circle around and it's too big to uh, represent in its entirety so that all you can do is really count. So you get a literal body count in a way which doesn't give you the same sense of consolation as a good story with a beginning, middle, end, and with catharsis at the end or something. And I think you're supposed to be nauseated by it, and it's supposed to be dizzying. And in that way, I think you see in contemporary literature that sometimes these database structures or database aesthetics seep in with a certain goal to criticize certain forms of representation as well. I think it's in many ways also a form of criticism um, on the ways in which media nowadays are, are consumed and dealt with and the seriality of things like one after another, one dead body after another, one crisis or disaster after another and the way that it's often packaged in a manner that we don't really have to deal with the most horrible sides of it. So I would definitely say that it poses a criticism and adds a layer of reflection to that. When authors are being quite negative about the effects of digital media on their literary art form, we should always take it with a grain of salt because uh, they are not to be trusted at all when they talk about this kind of thing. I think they are often trying to uh, self-marginalize the literary arts uh, with respect to other media as a form of self-promotion as well. I think all these proclamations about the end of the novel uh, are never so serious because they never stop writing novels. They will always continue writing them and defending them. So I think it's also a strategic way of like underlining the authenticity of what they do with respect to other media. And we have seen that with the advent of television, the telegram, um, even a radio, the newspaper, all these influences were at one point said to kill off the novel and none of them of course ever did. And what they do is inspire writers to kind of adapt their art form to all these influences. So if anything I would say that the digital and digital media kind of produce analog literature anew and produ produce literature to school anew and are a, a big source of inspiration rather than a really serious threat. So one of the interesting aspects of the interrelation between um, contemporary literary novels and other media is, I think, the influence of the TV series. So as I went along with my research, uh, lots of series were published, whereas um, the series as a form of publication for a long time had quite a negative association, like lowbrow uh, art or uh, consumption. And maybe the most famous example would be uh, the soap series. Uh, the series had this 
uh, image of being like repetitive, of being unoriginal and uh, very easy to just consume, you would be able to just um, maybe miss a couple of episodes and then jump right back in and understand everything. So this was kind of changing, I think, from the 90s onwards in television. And people now talk about the golden age of television where TV became more uh, more complex, became more innovative in combining episodic and serial forms, having longer character arcs, but also uh, more compressed episodic closure. And I think uh, works of literature have now kind of caught on. And there are literary writers who really look at the TV series as a source of inspiration. So in one of my chapters, I write about Mark Danieluski and his uh, The Familiar, which was uh, supposed to be a 27 volume uh, book series and then two installments every year and uh, well uh, they were all extremely big and monumental and then after a couple of years in 2015 or 2017 I think uh, this was terminated because there was really not enough interest in it and people were not really prepared to buy all these books and then devoting so much time into that. And I think this failure would also be informative in a way to test how uh, far people will go in an attention economy to devote their, their, their energy into one particular book series. Then a counterpoint to all of that in my chapter is uh, Game of Thrones, which of course has been hugely successful uh, in book form, uh, the, uh, the Song of Ice and Fire, but also uh, and more so even as an HBO television series. And what interests me about this case is that um, the way in which uh, its uh, fans are supposed to be waiting for the next volume of novels is like unprecedented in a way. The gaps are so completely uh, few, uh, f far between that um, you get this response on the internet where uh, fans from the first hour are really anxiously awaiting the last installment of the series and they really get mad at the author as well so they follow him on Twitter and on social media and whenever he goes to a concert or a sports match they really get angry because they keep saying like please you, you should be finishing the novel by now and sometimes he even does side projects and they get even more mad and then George Martin himself is quite um, is not very impressed by all of that. He just flips them the finger and sends like funny uh, pictures to his fans. But then you get this interesting thing when um, this uh, book series is adapted again to a TV series. The people are consuming it in different rhythms. They are waiting in different rhythms. They even go to separate platforms online to discuss like the the rookie uh, version of the development of events and there's people who are able to compare the two. So all of this I think is very informative to see what are the limits of each medium and how can they look at each other for inspiration. Cats are of course like really in the top three of most important uh, things considered on the internet.